I, I select some uh, topics to share with you, especially about leadership, because I really think that, uh, I really believe that we need to invest in uh, leadership development, and we are always learning something new. I've seen, I noticed that some of you probably uh, have more experience in church leadership than I have, uh, but I, I learn in my own experience and um, learning from others also some um, important points that I want to share with you. So the first presentation will be an introduction about leadership, spiritual leadership, and how this uh, should be understood in the light of the Bible and um, the example of Jesus in our lives. So think about having a great task to fulfill, uh, having all the plans, but maybe you missed um, something in the process or starting, uh, starting the wrong way. So think about this. Some people like to climb mountains. I like to build planes in the air. Some people like to fly planes. Some people like to build planes. Some people like to fly planes. Some people like to build planes. Some people like to fly planes. Some people like to build planes. Some people like to fly planes. Some people like to build planes. Some people like to fly planes. Some people like to build planes. Some people like to fly planes. Some people like to build planes. Some people like to fly planes. Some people like to build planes. Some people like to fly planes. Some people like to build planes. So uh, you may have an important task to do, but there are some steps that need to be followed, right? So you need to have uh, not just a plan, but to organize in a strategic way that will be uh, fulfilling what you're supposed to be uh, doing. So uh, what is leadership? What kind of experience or example um, uh, Jesus uh, gave to us? So we read in Luke chapter 19, verse 10, that Jesus explained or summarized his mission in a very simple way. And I like the way Jesus presents his um, you know, teachings and, and describe his own ministry. Uh, he's so practical and he's so simple that a child can understand and at the same time can be so deep that uh, uh, someone with a lot of experience or a higher education can still find something to think and meditate about it. So Jesus said, for the Son, can we read it all together? For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Pretty objective. Jesus had a pretty good idea of his mission and what the reason he was here for. And you remember several times on his ministry that people came to him and, uh, and it was like, um, was a distraction or a detour on his ministry. Uh, one day, his mom came to him and said, well, oh, they're missing uh, wine in the party. And he answered, what I have with this? And some people might think that was kind of a, a weird you know, answer to Jesus and maybe even some disrespect from that, but not really. Uh, that's, that wasn't the case. But he was focused on something that he had to do. In another um, occasion, um, a woman came to him and asked for a favor. And he said, I came with a purpose, to reach out the lost sheep of Israel. And, uh, and then he made comments about her. It was like him, he was putting her down, but actually he was testing his, her faith. And, uh, and after... Uh, that short conversation, she received what she was uh, asking for. <coughs> but Jesus was pretty focused on what he had to do in his mission. That's the point I'm, I'm trying to make here. So uh, Christian leadership follows the pattern of uh, the servant uh, leadership. And I know that sometimes it's harder for us to, to understand what is the meaning of um, you know, being a servant uh, and being a leader. But Jesus explained this in the words, the one who rules like the one who serves. And uh, I understand by these words of Jesus that there is no difference in the uh, role that you are fulfilling now. 
You might be an elder, a pastor, or a conference officer, or any other level of the church organization, but we are all the same, equal, before God. We just have different roles to fulfill for a period of time. So if you're being elected for a position, that's not something that you, you own. It's a role that you are fulfilling now at this point. So Jesus said, if you really want to serve uh, or to rule over, to be a leader, you need to learn how to serve. These are the words um, of Jesus. The one who rules is the one who serves. So uh, let's see a few steps on the biblical uh, theology of leadership. The first important thing is that Jesus um, and God is the real uh, ruler. So the real leader is God. So whatever we do in leadership, we're just assisting and helping people to know more about the real leader who is God. When we look around us and we hear about news like we just heard from Anthony and we saw in the news during the week and we think something's wrong with this world. Because if God is the real Lord, He is the real ruler, something is wrong with this leadership. What do you think? So what's the reason that things are not so good like the way it used to be? Something's wrong with those who are following the leader, right? So, in a sense, when our first parents gave up the dominion that was given to them over all this um, new uh, created uh, planet, they gave away the leadership responsibility. So, um, uh, the enemy took control of it. But it's important to understand that God will take it again. He intends again to be the direct ruler of humankind. Another important point is leadership is a role we fulfill, not a status. And this is why I was saying a little while ago, and I, I work in different places, and um, at least in two different divisions, and I was elect for uh, office a couple of times, but every time it comes to the end of the term, I don't know how you do here in Australia, but in, in, in my country, they, let, they have a lot of changes. Once in a while, they change. In other places, they don't change much. But whenever it comes to the end of the term, I pack my personal stuff and put it in the car. So I don't have to come in the middle of the night to, to collect my personal you know, belongings. Because the church asks you to do something at the end of the year or every two years, whatever you know, term, you are elect for, you finish your work. And you don't have to feel that you're being rejected if the church didn't ask you to go back and do the same thing. I was having, um, I was pastoring um, in New England and one of the ladies and one of the leaders there, an, um, an elderly lady, and she was personal minister in that church for years. But that year, she wasn't elected for the job. And I was concerned to let her know, and I told um, uh, the committee that I would talk to her. When I spoke to her, she said, oh, pastor, I'm so happy. I said, what? I'm so happy because now I don't have to sit in committees and church board. I'll have more time to do God's work. <laughs> and I thought, what a wonderful uh, attitude. And she actually, after that, she developed a ministry helping the new um, um, comers to discover their gift. So she kind of become a, a spiritual gift, uh, you know, mentor for the newly baptized people. It was a blessing for so many people because now she had more time for ministry. Uh, that's the kind of attitude that God expects from all of us. Leadership is a role we fulfill, not a status. Leadership requires high standards. As a leader, we, people will be looking to us, and we have to give a testimony, a good testimony of the leadership position that we, we are um, fulfilling. And all the time remember that we should lead humbly. Don't let your position you know, go up in your mind and think that you are better than anybody else because you are fulfilling a special role in the leadership of the church. Is that pretty simple, but it's important to be reminded. What do you think? 
I see some of you taking notes. The other had a good memory, so you don't need that. Uh, something that took place in recent years in the church. Uh, in the mid-50s, uh, church growth movement was a pretty uh, big thing in the Christian church. Adventist church takes a while sometimes to um, start to be involved in uh, new trends, but uh, was big in the 60s to 80s. Then we have church health, and then we have uh, spiritual, how do they call it, Nat natural church development, which are all good tools that we can still use and we are still using. Uh, but then in the late um, uh, last 15, 20 years, the missional approach to, um, to uh, leadership or mission uh, took place in the more recent years. Um, so this is, um, this is something that we see some kind of trends that are taking place. It looks like um, we see those movements and we think, what is the best, what is the next thing that is coming? Well. I remember visiting my country a few years ago and I saw on the cover of one of the major magazines in Brazil, there was um, a picture of a large church building saying, mega churches are coming. And I, as I told you, Darren, sometimes I, I receive some uh, friends coming to visit me and they see that the, that the church in North America is struggling and not having the, uh, the quick or rapid growth they used to have in the past. And people sometimes are tempted, especially when we come from a different country and we see the church in the Western world, like um, in Europe or America or here in Australia, in countries that are more secularized and, uh, you know, religion doesn't grow and doesn't, uh, it's not part of the majority of the population. So, um, and they, sometimes you go and visit a country that is more, uh, you know, secular, and we are tempted to say, oh, the church is not doing well here, or in our country, the church is doing much better. So I tell them, listen, whatever happened in Europe or Australia now happening in North America, it will happen in Latin America and other uh, countries also. It's just a matter of time, because that's the way they trend. Uh, when you said uh, what is happening in small towns or even villages, this, the, the secular and postmodern way of thinking are affecting anybody because of television, because of the internet and the connection, globalization and all those stuff that we don't understand very well. But uh, it's part of the process of, uh, you know, society going away and uh, going away of, of God and what is important. But at the same time, we have an opportunity because um, spirituality is a big thing today. And you can see it through the movies and the, and the theaters, the series on TV, a lot of stuff in spirituality. So the people today with the postmodern way of thinking, they might be not interested in religion, but they might be interested in, in spirituality. And you can be religiously uh, correct and spiritually corrupt. That was the problem with the Pharisees in, the, in Jesus' time. Religion was so important for them that they forgot the relationship with God, which the proper meaning or the, or the spirit or the reason of any religion. So for us today, uh, we may feel the same challenge because we are so secure that we have the truth, we have the gospel for this time, we have the present truth, and we are the remnant, but we cannot forget that every day our daily responsibility is to look for and spend time with the Lord. And this is why Ellen White says we should, be, we should spend at least an hour every day. And even more if you are a leader, even more if you are in the front of leadership and you are supposed to give uh, and share with others, we cannot share what we don't have. So with this new uh, approach that is called missional, uh, there is a kind of revival or renaissance of the original meaning of, the, of Christianity. So it's actually nothing new. It's more biblical than it used to be. We have a lot of things in our church that is just Christian tradition, but it's not based in the Bible. And I'm not saying it's not good. I'm just saying that it's tradition, Christian tradition and not 
based in the Bible. Tradition is not bad in itself, unless if it's against the Word of God, right? We have good traditions at home. Uh, we still uh, love rice and beans, arroz y abicuelas, no? Uh, but I remember spending uh, my first trip to America and I was, um, you know, we are for a few days looking for a place to eat and we couldn't speak the language. It was very hard. Uh, but then one day we found a place to have a buffet and they have rice and guess what? They have beans. The only challenge was that I didn't know. I, I, brought, I put a lot of rice and beans on my plate, but then I found out that the, the beans were sweet. So something was wrong. Who in the world is going to put sugar on sweet? Because on my tradition, my culture, that wouldn't make any sense, right? Well, guess what? This morning I have kind of sweet beans and for breakfast. But, um, uh, uh, but tr tradition itself is not bad as long as it's not against the word of God, right? But what I was saying before was that um, we need to look for and trying to have in our service, in our spiritual uh, devotional time, be as close as possible to the Word of God and, uh, and the early church and, uh, and uh, the example of Jesus and the apostles. So uh, this understanding of um, missional thinking or missional leadership is actually a return to the biblical New Testament Testament model of leadership. So let's go back to the Bible. This is the idea. So talking about leadership and mission, the basic mission of Christianity is not the health or growth of institutional uh, churches, but the expansion of the kingdom of God. So think about this when, you, when you're doing any kind of outreach. See, the reason we do outreach is it should not be to make new members or to expand the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It has to be beyond that. Our main purpose should be to expand God's kingdom. Of course, we understand that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has a special purpose, and this time in history. And this is the reason we are here, right? But we need also to be receptive and understanding and inclusive to other Christians that are trying to do their best as they also preach the gospel. And not having a kind of um, you know, superior attitude, think that we are better than anybody else. I don't know if you heard that story, but uh, I was reminded not too long ago by our, our classmate, um, Honorio um, uh, Anthony, attending uh, the classes together. We had a friend, he was Presbyterian, but he was from Brazil, so I connect with him, and one day he came to me and said, how come in our country we are enemies, and here we are prayer partners? And he told uh, a story about a Seventh-day Adventist. He said that in heaven, there will be a special group in heaven, and they're gonna be by themselves, and uh, others pass by and say, who are they? They say, Shh, don't say anything aloud. They are Seventh-day Adventists, and they think they're the only ones here. You probably heard that, right? But uh, that's most of the time the attitude or the, the way we think about ourselves. We are so good. No, we had, a, we had the truth that uh, to be saved, you need to be Adventist. Well, that's not written in the Bible, okay? Uh, uh, and I guess um, uh, we're going to have some surprises when you get there, right? Uh, but anything we can do to help someone to move from um, uh, agnostic, uh, atheist, or um, Christian but not religious person, uh, someone that never reads the Bible, don't understand the basics of the gospel, and help them to move to a closer relationship with Jesus and accept him as Lord and Savior, this is outreach and evangelism. And this is our mission. And doing that, we're going to help to expand God's kingdom. John Maxwell said once the spiritual leader is the one who know the way, go the way, show the way, who live with people to know their problems and live with God in order to solve them. It's like what, um, well, um, Enoch doing something like that, right? He walked 
with God, so close with God, but at the same time he was among uh, uh, men living as a common person. But he spent so, so much time with God that one day the Lord said, you know what? You, we have been spending so much time together. Don't even go back to our home. Stay with me. And he never came back to his place. That's the kind of uh, uh, a lifestyle that we, we need to have. For many years I taught, uh, and I even, I think I, I said this so many times, everybody has to be an evangelist. Well, the Bible doesn't say that we have the gift of evangelists. It says that some have the gift of evangelist. Some, not all. But all of us need to have an evangelistic way of living. It's different, right? So I may not be you know, a good preacher doing public evangelism or preaching to large crowds, but I need to live in a way that people will ask questions and I should with humble heart and um, you know, in a caring way, sharing the good news of salvation. So I, we all need to live an evangelistic uh, lifestyle, but not all will be evangelists in the sense of um, preachers and that. You understand what I'm trying to say, right? Yeah, make sure you follow me because uh, even, um, uh, you know, it's not my first language and the accent doesn't help much. So. <laughs> Uh, you let me know if it's not clear. I can I can say the same story in different words. All right. So, uh, what's that? Yeah. I'm still struggling with that. Yeah. <laughs> so the church is an organic organism, a community that is on a mission. So the purpose of um, of um, all the organization is to give support to the local church doing their ministry. It's not the, old, the other way around. I, I hear a lot of times leaders in church doing you know, kind of speeches saying, well, please support this project. Support that project. No, no, no. I think it's the other way around. We are here, the administration, the departments are here to support your work. So you tell us, how can I help you? You know, when you go to stores in America, it's like Walmart. They have on their badge, how may I help you? Okay, that's the idea. The organization exists to facilitate the process of what's taking place in the local church because that's where ministry really happens. So uh, one often referred to as the Great Commission sends the church on a mission of making disciples. The other perhaps best referred to as the Great Omission of the church and it's described in Matthew 25 and presents faithfulness to God as evidenced in acts of social and humanitarian compassion. So it's not only what we say, but it's also the way we live and how we react uh, with the events that are taking place around us. So this is the kind of church that we had in the beginning, the early church, the apostolic church. The New Testament church has all the hallmarks of a total involvement movement with little or no centralized structures. They didn't have ordained or professional ministry class and no official church buildings. I'm not saying that we cannot have that, but I'm saying this was not part of the early church. Later on, they start using, you know, um, buildings and they have organized uh, leadership of the church. And the apostolic role is the ultimate role of these, the, these leaders with the purpose to call the denomination away from, the, from maintenance back to mission because that's the reason we exist. So I challenge you this weekend to think uh, this way. As leaders, our main responsibility is not just to feed the people and to you know, hold a nice spiritual service. It's way more than that. It's to lead our church back again to mission, the reason we were established. So what is the, what is the right way of putting that? The church has a mission or the mission has a church? What came first, the chicken or the egg? So that's a, a very important you know, dilemma to find out. 
What came first? The church or the mission? The mission, are you sure? So that if that's right, the church was organized or was built to fulfill mission, right? So in that sense, mission is more important than the church. Yes or no? Are you sure of that? Well, when the church was built or organized, the first step in the organization of the church, Ellen White says, there was when Jesus select the 12. And then later on he said, I will build my church. And I like the message translation that says, I will build my church so full of energy, not even the gates of hell will prevail against it. Can you imagine? And I remember so many times leaders and elders in my church saying, we need to protect the church. Protect the church? Jesus said the opposite. You know, the devil needs to be afraid because the church is going out in mission. So he needs to protect himself. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's not the church that has to be, you know, enclose the building and uh, be careful. Don't let the word come in. No, no, no. It's the other way around. Watch out because the church is going out. And that's the reason we exist. So this kind of leadership or role um, of um, apostolic leadership that we were talking about uh, during our conversation at the table there, by, uh, there are some important points that we, uh, we, we have to remember. They, they should be pioneering new ground for the gospel and church. So those leaders, they need to be involved in missionary effort and church planting. That's the reason the leadership was established from the beginning in the early church and the beginning of the early Adventist movement. The application and integration of apostolic theology to make sure that we are um, uh, biblically sounded in our teachings and our preachings. You are a leader. You are responsible. Be careful if you are not preaching. Be careful when you invite someone else to come and preach in your church because you are responsible for the preaching there. If the pastor is not there, you are responsible for the pulpit. It doesn't mean that you have to preach every Sabbath, but it means that you are responsible for whatever, whatever is said from the pulpit. You are responsible for that. Make sure the doctrine presented is biblical. To create the environment in which other ministries emerge. So you need to be, as a leader, you need to be a facilitator. The church is built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets. And uh, we, as individuals, we are not perfect. We don't have all the gifts. Jesus is the only one that has all the gifts. So when we create a team, a leadership team, then we can be perfect because we have different gifts. And all together, then we have plenty of gifts to serve the church and the community. And uh, I always remember those words that Jesus had um, to Peter. And we remember when uh, Jesus called Peter and, and asked him, do you love me? And he asked three times. And you probably heard so many you know, Bible studies or sermons uh, based on that verse. And you probably heard that Jesus use one kind of word for love, and Peter answered with a different word. And, uh, you know, preachers, we always try to make a big deal with those, you know, Greek words and stuff like that. But the bottom line is this. Jesus asked him three times. Oh, well, he asked three times because Peter just denied Jesus three times. That could be the reason. Or Jesus wanted to make sure that Peter understood his personal call. The basic qualification for Christian, anyway, uh, is service. We cannot be a leader or be involved in Christian service if we don't love people. So this is the most desirable and indispensable uh, quality for Christian service. Love. This is the essential qualification. Ellen White says, without the love of Christ in the heart, the work of the Christian minister is a failure. So the model in the New Testament is... Um, it's pretty simple. The main function of the church is to prepare the believer for ministry. 
John Maxwell said, the spiritual leader is the one who know the way, go the way, and show the way. Remember, I said this. In the Bible, in the New Testament, this is, this is the theme. When, when we say, um, clergy and, um, and lay team ministry, I don't like using those words because in my understanding, lay sounds like a non-professional person. Someone that is not a specialist, uh, but it's just for you know, for the um, uh, teaching purpose. I'm using those words, okay? Even though I don't, I don't like it to do this separation because in the beginning they didn't exist, right? Because lay means it comes from the word allows that it means people. So we are all people of God. There is no two classes of people. That's not biblical. That's something that came in the Christian tradition. Oh, in that case, this tradition is not biblical. So we need to be careful with that. Right? I don't know if it makes sense what I just said. But the New Testament uh, model, it was in the early church, the laity, the people in general, were seen as the performers of ministry. And the clergy, the leaders, they were the trainers and equippers for ministry. So the main, the main function of the church is to prepare the believer for ministry. Laity are the performers of ministry. Who, are, who, who is part of the laity? Everyone. Everyone, exactly. Because if I'm part of uh, the people of God, I'm part of the laity. Okay? So what is the function of the leaders or the clergy that we call? They are trainers and equippers. Of ministry so if I go out if I'm hired by the conference as a pastor and I go out and give Bible studies I'm doing this because I'm being paid for that's that's not a biblical model but if I take with me one or two people and I train them to to do Bible study and to lead out Bible study I'm training and equipping them then I'm fulfilling my job when I visit someone that is sick in the hospital, I'm not doing this because I'm paid for, for, but I'm doing this because I'm part of the body of Christ. I'm part of the laity. So if the church waits for the pastor to come to visit someone that is sick, or there is a newcomer, a new visitor attending needs Bible study, and let's wait for the pastor to come next month to start Bible study, that's not biblical. Okay? That's not the biblical model of leadership. This could be tradition, religious tradition. And we know that historically, we always remember Constantine uh, because of the influence he had with the change of day of worship from Saturday to Sunday. But probably the, even the most, another most, maybe the most important influence from him was the change of the way of worship and the way they have establishing priests and now attending or, or having worship service in big uh, temples. That changed totally the way we understand religion. And because of that, we have in our heritage, Christian tradition, which is not biblical in this case, a way of thinking that is not the model of um, the New Testament model of leadership. Ellen White says that Christ's followers have been redeemed for service. Our Lord teaches that the true objective of life is ministry. And ministry, the word ministry means what it means, we were talking about this during dinner. Service, exactly, that's the meaning of the word. It's the same word for diacono, deacons. Christ's followers have been redeemed for service. So the reason we are here, it's a purpose, not a fate, nor chance, nor luck, nor coincidence, that you are here today at this very moment. You are alive because God wanted to create you. And the Bible says the Lord will fulfill his purpose in me. So the word ministry has been misunderstood. In the Bible, the words servants and minister, they are synonyms. As are service and ministry. The verb diaconal means to minister to, to relieve, to assist, to supply with the necessities of life, provide the means of living, a commission or ministry in the service of the gospel. Is that pretty simple, isn't it? So in that sense, all of us should be deacons, 
even though we select some and give them the title, because they are kind of the managers or they facilitate the process of organization to make sure that everybody in the body of Christ receives the kind of uh, attention they deserve. If you're a Christian, you're a minister. And when you are serving, you are ministering. I remember once I was hearing uh, a, a gospel radio um, station, and I heard in an interview, and uh, during that conversation, uh, the person from the station asked the, the guest, so what, what do you do? And the person said, I'm an ordained plumber. I said, what do you, what do you mean by that? I said, I'm an ordained plumber. And then he explained, well, I was called by God for ministry, but I, do my, I make my way of living in plumbing. Right? It makes sense, no? So you, you above everything you do, you've been called by God. So you are a minister. So you can minister as you drive, as you work in construction, as you work in the office, or in the factory. It doesn't matter what a kind of you know, activity you do. It doesn't qualify or, or identify or defines who you are. Because we are all ministers called by God. In the healthiest of churches, the pastor is doing the leading while the lay people are doing the ministry. This is a biblical uh, statement, even though you know, the person is not Adventist. But in this case, he, he made a quite you know, good statement here. And this is clearly the New Testament model of leadership. I missed the time that I started, so I have no idea. What time you planning to finish? <laughs> a few minutes. A couple of minutes. Okay. A couple of minutes. Prophetic minutes. Yeah. Okay. No, I have the I have more time to talk to you. I'm not gonna wear you out tonight. So you come back tomorrow, right? So uh, just a couple more slides, because this presentation I'm actually gonna I, I split in two parts. So I'm gonna continue on Sunday morning. The most excited one when the Bible uh, presents the New Testament presents the relationship between elders, pastors, uh, and overseers, or um, the different words used in the New Testament for the leadership, and it's pretty uh, quite amazing. We're going to spend some time on that. So, just trying to finish that uh, part or that concept of spiritual leadership in the New Testament model. First uh, Peter two verse five: All Christians belong to the holy priesthood, and this is not a New Testament teaching only. That was presented in Exodus chapter 19. If you go to Exodus chapter 19, you're going to see that. Right after when um, Moses organized the, pe the people of Israel in groups and established leadership of 100, 500, thousands. Those uh, leaders, the church, the people of Israel was organized in a certain way that now uh, Moses didn't have to stay with uh, you know, hundreds or thousands of people in front of him the whole day. Remember, his father-in-law gave uh, this advice. So I'm pretty sure that his wife was complaining. This man is crazy. He stayed the whole day with a line of people giving them advice. And, uh, and at the end of the day, he didn't talk to all of them. Some will take a note or get a number. So they come online the following day to talk to him again. So when Jethro came and spoke to Moses, he said, what you're doing is not good. Remember those words? He was doing God's work. He was doing the best that he could. And his father-in-law came and said, what you're doing is not good. It's not good for you. It's not good for your family. It's not good for these people. When he organized the leadership in different levels, the Bible says there was peace among the people. Moses went to spend more time with God. So the leader became more spiritual because now he had more time to spend more time with the Lord. And the leaders, we have a, several layers of people involved in leadership. And we have a saying in my country, say, those who are paddling, don't rock the boat. If you are busy working, you don't complain, you don't give trouble. So if you empower and equip and involve more people in work, you're going to have less trouble. That's the reality, and that's the principle. Uh, God wants you to have both a ministry in the body of Christ and a mission in the world. 1 Peter 2, verse 9 
says the royal priesthood is called to declare the praises of him that he called us. So there's a purpose for this call. And the purpose is to share the good news of salvation. So discipleship is a journey. And leadership is part of this journey. So in the process of knowing Jesus, know, uh, receiving him as personal savior, becoming a follower of Jesus, this is disciple making process, we understand and discover our own gifts, our personal call, and we employ those gifts to serve others and to share the good news of salvation. We're going to come back again to this principle on Sunday morning, and we're going to talk uh, a little bit more about the discipleship journey. But uh, we identified ourselves with the life of Jesus, transforming the secular realm, serving with generosity, and participating in spiritual activities. This is part of the process of getting acquainted with Jesus, developing a way of living uh, that will be closer to him and in our daily walking uh, and developing this uh, relationship as followers of Jesus. In the New Testament, the church does not have a priesthood. The church is a priesthood. You remember in the Old Testament, the priests, they have the double function of um, um, interceding for the people before God and representing God in front of the people. In the New Testament, that doesn't exist because we have full access in the presence of God through the blood of Jesus. And we also receive the call to serve others, so we, we don't need mediators to have access to God, and we can help anybody through the Word of God to understand God's will. So the emphasis, the practice of faith over the con content of faith, search the roots of authenticity in the life and practice of the early church. So we're being saved for a mission. And Ellen White says that the latter rain cannot come until the largest portion of the churches, the church are laborers together with God. Um, she also said, the church is God's appointed agency for the salvation of man and was organized for service and its mission is to carry the gospel to the world. I want to um, uh, tell you a, a story as I close tonight. Um, we had a, a pretty bad storm the end of 2012. I was living in New York during that time. And um, the, the storm was um, pretty heavy. And uh, with the high tide, like we, I saw in the news uh, last night on the East Coast, and you see the erosion and getting close to those um, uh, big houses by the, by the sea. Well, in New York, is a, if you've been there or saw, uh, this, the downtown area is an, an island. And with the high tide and big waves, the water entered the city. And all those big buildings, they have basements. And um, um, the lower levels were flooded. The subways were flooded. Most of the... Um, uh, even the high sky uh, skyscrapers, they people didn't have access because uh, they lost energy. We had uh, for a week we we didn't have energy at home either. Um, we we spent a couple of nights that was too cold uh, in another place to have electricity. Then it came back power to our place. We have a family staying with us with three kids and and a big dog. That was uh, fun for three weeks, but it's uh, it was part of the adventure. Uh, but the office, we couldn't w use the, the, the conference office because we didn't have um, electricity. So we had a, um, for a while, we used the community center for that. And we went out to trying to serve the community and help the needs of those who lost everything. This is one of the um, um, people, this lady, live in front of the ocean. And, uh, and you can see in some of these pictures what happened with the, a beautiful uh, boardwalk. Uh, in front of her apartment, and all the debris and the cars that were taken. Well, we have in that area uh, a Spanish church uh, that was recently renovated. I mean, it was a beautiful building. And when the community service uh, came with the project to turn that church into a center of distribution for goodies in the community, uh, some of the elders came and said, no, 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 this church, no. We spend so much money and years renovating this church. We, we can do that. So, no problem. Next door, there was another church, an evangelical church, with a big parking lot. 
So the, the community service director brought the trucks and started unloading all the goodies on the next door church. So the elders, you know, uh, they, they brought uh, the board together and said, this is not right. How come the Adventist community service is distributing everything uh, in this evangelical church? Uh, we are here, they need to come back. Well, they opened the church, finally. Okay. And uh, when I was there, I saw the church inside. The church was a mess, okay? Some of you may think this was disrespectful, but the church became a, a warehouse. And people walking in and out from the community, getting clothes, they were serving food on the street and distributing, you know, cleaning supplies and stuff like that. So you can see lines of people, hundreds of people, day after day. We have a volunteer, a young lady that coordinates this project on this church. For, she worked as a volunteer on this site for almost three months with lines of hundreds of people on a daily basis. So at the end of the day, that was a Sunday right after, the week after the, uh, the storm, and I looked to that line and I saw the situation that was inside the church. It didn't look good at all because all the mess and the, the challenges they were facing. And I drove around and at the, before the end of the block, there was another church, a little church, and I saw a young man in front of the church with a dark suit and he looked I mean, sharp, very well dressed. And look, I looked through the church and saw everything organized and clean and neat. But then I thought, if Jesus was passing by that day, what church do you think he would stop by? I saw his face uh, presented in everyone that was in line that day. They were in need. And he said, I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was sick and you came to visit me. Sometimes we are so concerned about having our church, you know, well organized, everything clean and in place, that we forget the, the, the reason we are here, the reason God has called us. So I want to challenge as we close tonight, think about the purpose that you have as a leader and uh, the opportunity for service that the Lord has given your own congregation. And as you uh, re uh, rest tonight, I'll try to do the same. Tomorrow morning, we're going to continue. And uh, may the Lord bless us during this weekend to be more effective and spiritual leaders uh, by God's grace. This is my prayer. Amen.